Support for the Dice Tower comes from listeners like you, and from The Op, also known as USAopoly, and from GameNerds.com. Thanks for your support. The Dice Tower, Episode 730. Mass Market Madness. Or games, something like that. Welcome to the Dice Tower, a podcast about board games and card games, and especially the people who play them. On today's show, we put you in a spooky mood with a new tale of board gaming horror, we answer questions from the mailbag, and we debate the very definition of mass market with our top ten. I'm Eric Summerer, and joining me now, the Jeffrey Giraffe of board gaming, it's Tom Vassell. I believe, I believe that Someday, someone's going to find this episode and go, what is Eric talking about? What does that even mean? And that's a little sad to me. I mean, when I was little, going to Toys R Us was an event. That or Kitty City. But Kitty City died a long time before Toys R Us. I don't know what Kitty City is. There was Kitty City, Toys R Us, and then the one in the mall, which was... um, KB. KB, right. They were the big three, not counting your... Um, giant, you know, the one in New York and, uh, what? oh yeah, like FAO Schwartz. Yeah, FAO Schwartz. Yes. But that was just an exciting thing to go to. I agree. And I wanted Absolutely. everything in the store, basically. Yes. I used to, <laughs> when I was a kid, I saw the, the shopping sprees. Do you remember those? Oh yeah. Where they'd give away, you know, like five lucky kids would just get a shopping cart and get to load whatever they wanted into their cart. And I thought there was nothing better on earth than that. <laughs> I really did. That was, I was never so jealous of anyone on TV. I didn't want a private jet. I didn't, I don't know what any of that stuff meant. I wanted a shopping cart and Toys R Us. Yes. Yeah. I just go down the Nintendo aisle and take all the little tags that you then had to take to the register. That's yeah. what I would do. Well, here's the thing. I mean, this is this is one of those times though where I'm 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 I'm, I'm a pretty decent futurist. Like when people go back in the day, things were better. Baloney. Things get better all the time. But I do miss. Yes, online shopping is very convenient and very useful, and superstores are okay. But man, toy stores were fantastic. That's true. Anyway, that's tangentially related to board games. Well, it is in a sense because. I mean, that's where I first saw a lot of my board games was at Toys R Us. They had, you know, a whole yeah. toy aisle. I mean, a whole board game aisle. I think I saw board games there more than I saw them at any other store. Um, sure. Yeah. Walmart wasn't huge for, for where I was when I was a kid. So Kmart was our store. And I don't remember seeing, I mean, I'm, I'm sure they had games there and such. But the number one place I would find games was be at the toy stores. Yeah. Yeah, at the mall, KB. I would always go to the back of the the at the back. KB always had mm-hmm. the ones where I went. It was always the back. Yes, and and occasionally KB would put stuff on big clearance. I think I got my copy of Star Wars Epic Duels for five or ten dollars when they were liquidating. I didn't even realize what I had at the time. Okay, well I'm, I'm a little older than that. I think um, <laughs> so. I don't remember that. I was in college when Epic Duels came out. I think. Or maybe even married at that point. But that doesn't mean I, I think, you know, you could still go to the toy store at that point. Yeah, but you should go there and know what you get at that point. You said you didn't know what you had. <laughs> I didn't know how rare it was. Ah, ha, ha, ha. Yes, the last game I bought at KB was eBay, the electronic card game. I remember that distinctly. Mm. I got that for five bucks. That was, and you're right, they, blow, they blew things out. Because in KB, for those of you who never went there, this was in the mall, and the store was, you had to, like, squeeze down the aisles. So in <laughs> Yes, the, in they the, were very, very thin. In the front of the store, they always had um, an area where there was barking dogs, those little barking dog <laughs> toys, a train, yep. and maybe some remote control cars that half of them didn't work because the kids yep. broke them. And then there would be a few other displays of whatever they were trying to get rid of that day. And then there was f- four aisles. And there was the dolls, there was the G.I. Joe and all that stuff. There was, I don't remember what the third aisle was, maybe stuffed animals or whatever. And then at the back, 
around the corner of the fourth aisle, and then around into the back was the board games. I distinctly remember where they were. <laughs> okay. I miss these days. I went and stood. The only time I ever stood in line um, on a uh, Black Friday, I did it one time in my life, and it was for KB. And I didn't even know why. I was just at the mall, and I was like, uh, which line should I get in? The KB line. And then I didn't buy anything. I was like, well, that seems like a waste of time. <laughs> All right. Well. Yeah, so board games. I'm back. I'm back. It's been. Indeed. It's been. Uh, it's been I, I haven't talked to you in a month. Yeah, it has been. So, well, I appreciate Crystal covering in the last episode and uh, or the last one that that. That was done with Eric. Well, I was in the last week's episode, too. Well, well you're just in all the episodes. Shows how much you've been paying attention. I have not been paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> We've been keeping the lights on for you, Tom. That's what's important. Well, it's been busy. They moved every convention into the same time frame. I'm not even, <laughs> yes. as we're recording this, Origins is going on, and we're not there. Yeah. Uh, so they we are ju- not. I've been seeing the pictures of, of folks at the convention center and the North Market and spots around Columbus, and I have to admit, I'm a little jealous. I don't know. I don't know if I'm jealous of Origins. Um, the, I'm jealous of just travel in general. Travel's not fun, but yes, I know what you mean. Gen Con was fantastic. I had a great time. I don't know that I would mind origins i just needed to go back home you know i don't want to be gone all the time and then essence two yes. weeks from today it's insanity wow. there's just there's maybe i feel really weeks. bad for the publishers who have had to do all of them in just one big row yeah you just they're like zombies i saw them they're just like oh buy our game <laughs> here we go but it is an interesting dynamic that's changing the industry in the sense that we're seeing a lot of so some of the big publishers left cons like asmodee was not at gen con and I, I wonder if they'll go back. You know, yeah. we'll have to wait and see till next year, right? But I wonder. And so, with them being gone, and several other larger publishers didn't go, the smaller publishers were—I shouldn't say the smaller, but they're all smaller than Asmodee. But publishers right. were able to really step up and and make their games. So, I I know I read at least a couple people like, where were all the games at Gen Con? I don't know what they're talking about. There were games everywhere, and. Also, for a lot of people, they saw games there. It was two years worth of games. Yeah. Right? So there is plenty of games. I've already been doing some preliminary. You know, we're not, we're now, as of us recording this, we are about to enter Q4. That's a few hours oh, away. Boy. And if you're listening to Just this, a few hours it away. is Q4. Um, yep. And this, that's the time of the year where I start thinking about best games of the year. Now, I usually wait yeah. till post Essen. You know, there's going to be a lot of games released there, but it's been a great year. There's been shipping woes. There's been not as many, you know, some some game delays. There's been some games haven't been made. A few board game companies have gone out of business, but there's mm. still a ton of games out there. I mean, anyone who thinks, oh, I, I, I don't know, I always am mind boggled when people are like, oh, there's nothing to play. Well, not to mention the 10,000 games that already existed. Right. There's just so much good stuff out there. So... Let's get started by by talking about that. But before we do, I want to just mention a few things. So we have some upcoming uh, events that that are happening. Um, October twenty seventh is uh, the registration date at noon. Is the registration date for Dice Tower East? Speaking of oh. things that hasn't happened for a while, folks at the Carib. Now I know that many of you listening are already coming to that. Um, because your tickets rolled over from 2019 to 2020 to 20, I'm sorry, from 2020 to 2021 to to, now to to 2022. But this is uh, over the the first week of July. Uh, It's going to be fantastic, folks. And so get those tickets when they go on. We'll talk more about that as time goes by. Uh, And the Dice Star Cruise is even closer. That's in February. And I'm, I'm, I'm saying this specifically that... We have almost a full group going on the Dice Tower Cruise. It's not completely full at this point in time, but I'm content with the numbers. So we are shutting down registration for that in two weeks. You will not be able to register it after that point. I'm going to give all the extra rooms we have back to the cruise, and we can do that. So if you want to come, it's now or never. Um, Now is your chance. This is not a fake, uh, you know, call in the next hour and... 
Uh, no, I'm really going to get rid of those rooms because we just need to prepare and things like that. So if you're on the fence, Dice Tag Cruise, I'm telling you, folks, it is a great experience. Mm-hmm. All righty. Well, with all that being said, I was talking about all these great games that are coming out. And I think all the games we're talking about today are have come out now or have been reprinted now. And five of them are good. <laughs> okay. This is not... A diss on you this time, Eric. Oh, good. Good, good. It's one of my games. It's not good. Do you, before I go, do you, can you do you guess which one it is? Ooh. Well, I don't know anything about one of them. I'm going to guess... I'm, I'm going to guess it's your third game. All right. Well, let's find out. About. Yeah. Well, I'll start with one that I, I did enjoy. Spoiler alert. It's called Wild Space. Da, this na, is a na, new na. one. Sorry. All right. <laughs> from you make Pandasaurus Games. You make my heart race. Na, 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 na. Uh, the uh, the designer is Joachim or Joachim Throme, uh, and the artist is Amelie Guinet. Uh, it is a the theme is that you're building a crew of spacefaring animals. Um, the theme is pretty pasted on. This is a set collection tableau building game. Um, the different suits that you are collecting are these animals. So there's like space monkeys, uh, there are chimpanzees, there's some, what else do we have? Rhinos, um, there are some owls. They're all wearing space suits. They're all adorable. It's really cool. Uh, there are some robots as well. And the way that you acquire these cards, uh, each of the cards have some sort of cool abilities and, and stuff that happens when you, when you play them. They trigger stuff. Um, but the first thing that you have to do is play one of your spaceships, you only have five of these, onto a planet. And when you first place them down on a planet, it usually says something like draw a bunch of cards or play a certain number of cards. Um, sometimes they have to be specific types of cards. Sometimes they have to be um, you know, any cards you want. Sometimes you have to pay some sort of prerequisite. But you land your ship on a little card in the center of the table and you're like, all right, the ability on this planet says I get to draw three cards or I get to play a card. And then you put one down in front of you, and often those will have some sort of ability that may have a prerequisite as well and may allow you to draw more cards or play more cards. So you can sort of create these cascades, um, these, these sequences of cards from your hand where you can boom, 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 play multiple cards in one turn. And the goal is to get as many of these out as possible because at the end of the game, you're going to be scored on uh, having a lot of certain types of animals, also having the full spread of all six animals, um, the robots are worth extra points, and, and it's basically a scoring of what you've managed to get out on the board. Um, the other action you can take with your uh, ships is that you can just slide them forward on the card, and every planet you explore has an additional action that says draw three cards or play one card. Um, some of the planets in the center are not available right away. You have to have at least three crew members in front of you, or at least six, or at least nine crew members in front of you, and more powerful actions will reveal once you have more things out. Um, so you can either land a new ship on a new planet, or slide one of the ships you have landed onto the, the basic action, draw three, play one. But you have to keep your engine churning and putting things out so you can get access to those better planets. You have new places to put your new ships because, again, you only have five of them. You only get to land five ships on the different planets. Um, and so you're faced with this decision. Do I slide the ones I have out there already or do I use a cool new action that's just been revealed that I just got gained access to? Um, it's a neat puzzle uh, trying to... Get the cards that are going to work well together, uh, waiting to play a particular card until you can get another one that, that synergizes with it. Um, you can wipe the, the pile of cards. The, there's, you know, it's got that ticket to ride draw mechanism where you can draw from the face up or draw from the top of the deck. Uh, so trying to get cards that work together, get something that fills a hole you need. Um, it's a cool little game. Um, and it, there's a good amount of thinking. It, the box says it's 30 minutes. We took well longer than that uh, for a first game. That's understandable. I still think it will go longer than 30 minutes. There's just a lot of deciding what you're going to play, um, which is fine. I'm, I'm okay with that. I didn't feel like it was taking forever, um, but it, it is longer than 30. I do really enjoy Wild Space, and I'm looking forward to building more space crews uh, with this adorable art in the future. Thumbs up. Yeah, yeah I'm, a, I'm still on the fence in Wild Space. 
Here's here's some of my concerns that again maybe more plays will will knock this out. It felt like the game ended before it got going. You know, like I'm trying to build a certain number of you know I'm trying to like you're trying to get some combos. Like I want to play this card. Yeah. Let me play this card, and you might pull a couple of those off, and then the game ends. I also feel, and maybe again it's just me, it felt very lucky. That if you draw cards, or let's say I'm trying to get the sixth animal, and it just doesn't show up for me. Mm-hmm. Not a lot you can do about that. Like when you're trying to collect sets of whether it's the same or different, or you're trying to get the extra robot scoring cards, they just right. might not come out. And then the other third, it just sounds like a lot of negative stuff, but they're like all minor things, right? That's why I'm not like hating on the game. But the third was these spaces on these planets, and Eric's very generously calling them planets. I don't even know what they are. They're just spaces you put your stuff on. I, sure. I don't feel the theme yeah, yeah. at all. But the, the theme is very thin. They, yes. they all do almost the same thing. The only reason to go to a new planet is just because you have to go to different spaces. And that yes. mechanism... That particular mechanism I didn't find interesting at all. That whole, I'm going to put down so many workers and then move them to the second half. Yeah, That's not that interesting when they're almost all the same. They're almost all, draw some cards, play a card. Draw yeah. some cards, play this kind of card. It just... yeah. The game is very restrictive if you look at it from a you know from a little bit of an outside lens, and then coupling that with the luck, I wonder. And yet, it doesn't feel super light. It's it's light, but it's I mean, there's a lot right. of, there's a lot of different things going on in the game. So I don't know yet. Maybe and maybe I'm wrong. So I'm not giving a negative review. I just I just wonder. Mm-hmm. Well, the, the, the landing of the planets on the planets, I think, is not supposed to be that interesting. I think that is the restraint that you are working within in order to draw the cards and play the cards. Um, it, it is something you have to manage as opposed to, ooh, I'm excited to play on this particular planet. Uh, and, and as far as the time frame goes, I understand what you're saying, but again, that's another one of the restraints you're under. You get only the 10 actions. You get to land five ships and slide five ships, and that's your whole. So make those 10 turns work is the goal of the game, and keep your engine churning, your hand churning, and and search for the cards you need by discarding cards to wipe the pile and search through the deck. It n- Luck of the draw is going to play a role for sure. Um, But I think the time frame is just about right because the last couple of turns are big turns um, if you're playing your your actions right. And you might be right. (laughs) I (laughs) I really don't know yet. So okay. All right, I want to talk a game about. uh, I think it's pronounced Iki or it's I K I. Sure, I go Iki. Iki. This is actually a reprint of an older game it originally came out in 2015 and it was just reprinted um, from a company called sorry we are french brought to america from hachette the designer Mm -hmm. is kuda yamada uh they did one other game called stone garden which i don't know much about but this is uh this game is set here in japan and you are essentially walking around in this village it's a worker movement game you've won a uh, person walking around in a village and each round of the game, and I think there's tw- 12 rounds in this game, maybe 13. There's like a, one extra special round at the end for New Year's. that You play three rounds in each season. You're going to be moving this person a certain number of steps, and where you land, you'll take that action. You also have the opportunity to hire workers and put them in different spots on the board so that when someone lands there, or if you could be you or somebody else, they can not only take these the, the action on that space, but also take the action of the person put there. So you're trying to make some cool combos and get points that way. When you hire a worker, that anytime someone else uses them or anytime your person moving around the board makes a full circuit, you get kind of experience in these people. They move, they, they, they get a little bit better and eventually they'll retire, giving you some permanent bonuses that will happen at the end of every season. 
This is a point salad game of sorts where there's points and things. You get points for building these cool buildings. There's fire that happens three times a year, and you need to try to guard against this fire. But you can get points from different having a bunch of workers from different types. Uh, you get some some sync, some sort of synchronicity bonus. I don't remember what it's called, like a friendship bonus for having the same kind of artisans in the same area at the end of each round and there's just many different ways to get points and i really like that like buying fish over the course of the game one of the places you can stop at sells fish and you can buy fish and so if you have a fish if you bought one every season you're going to get a lot of points but you can also ignore that and do other things so uh, i really like this for the mechanisms but the production of this is fantastic. It's fantastic for two reasons. One, it's fantastic art, great pieces, all the little meeples and things like that are, are good. But more than that, the rule book is really clear. But even more than that, everything is written on the board in the sense of it shows on your little player board and on the board itself, it shows a symbol for every action that you will possibly take at the end of a round. You put a coin in every uh, every worker that hasn't been hired, and you do this and that, and it's all marked on the board. It's really clear. I didn't have to look at the rule book much at all, and I was really happy with that. And this has a two-player variant, and it's a two- to four-player game, but the two-player variant is not a dummy player. There's just a few minor changes that make it a very nice, good tactical game. I really like this one. It's I K I Iki, I hope. Cool. Next for me is a game called Cascadia. It's designed by Randy Flynn. It has art by Beth Sobel, who, by the way, has a Kickstarter for a deck of cards that looks absolutely gorgeous right now. I don't know if it's still going on. I think it still is. Anyway, the publisher that I played from was AEG, but I've seen several others. Flat Out Games, I think, may have been a, a co uh, producing partner here. There's a few other publishers, but the version I played was AEG. In Cascadia, you are uh, building a, a landscape of tiles. It's a tile laying, drafting, tile drafting, tile laying game. Um, and you're building this map. Uh, the, the different tiles, the hex tiles have terrains, different terrains on them. And they also have symbols that represent different animals on them. There will be five different animals in your game. And each time you play, there will be slightly different scoring rules for each of the animals that you are playing with. So there's bears and there's um, foxes and eagles and stuff like that. So on your turn, you start out with one little triple uh, tile unit in front of you. But on your turn, you're going to draft a pair you will have laid out in the center of the table um, four tiles and four animal chips that get drawn from a bag. And you will draw a pair of them. Um, usually you have to draw uh, the two that are matched up, but you can also acquire these, these leaf tokens that let you mix them up. You know, take one from column A and one from column C. Uh, but anyway, you've got a tile and you've got a, an animal. So you connect the tile. It doesn't have to match up, but you are trying to create large groupings of these terrains and then place um, the animal on one of the matching spaces that you have on your map that you are building. So you will always have three open slots at the beginning of a turn uh, because you are drafting one tile, drafting one animal, and placing both. And you are trying to follow the rules of the different animals. So like the eagle card that we played with, uh, the eagle was going to score for the largest network of eagles, but the eagles can't be next to each other, but they have to be in lines of sight from each other. And so you're trying to connect, not get them too close, but trying to connect the two of them. Uh, bears needed to be in pairs, but not next to other bears. Um, the foxes scored for pairings of other animals around them. Uh, the, was it the elk? I think elk or deer um, were scoring for getting a, a cluster in a specific pattern. Stuff like that. And you're just sort of building your map, drafting, and, and continuing around until you've gone through the entire deck uh, of tiles, and then you score the animals you've got. It's straightforward. I liked the setting up your future actions. You know, you when you draw a tile, a terrain tile, you're not just looking at the animal that's on it, but also the terrain that's on it, trying to match up to what you're building. Um, because you're also scoring for the largest, yes, the largest 
single grouping of a particular terrain, and you also get a bonus if you have the most of a particular terrain. And then you're scoring for the different animals. Um, and so you have multiple reasons why you would want a tile, or multiple reasons why you'd want a particular animal disc. And, uh, and trying to draft those before somebody takes a very useful one is important. Um, I liked that churning. I liked the pre-planning, but it's not that much pre-planning. You have to play from the hip a little bit. Very neat game, um, I, and I think it would appeal to, um, to a wide range of folks. I could play this with my family without too much difficulty, and, uh, and the animal illustrations are gorgeous. I wouldn't expect anything else from Beth Sobel. So Cascadia, another thumbs up from me. Yeah, I like this one. It's a nice, uh, pleasant, pleasant is the best word I can say. It, it is, one. very much so. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, surprisingly, this week, the Marvel X-Men United sets got sent out to people. This is wave one of their two wave shipping so it's just the base set you know the gob smackingly humongous boxes of extra stuff will come who knows sometime next year likely (laughs) yeah but this is the same game as the original x-men united it's a cooperative game in which you take uh, a few heroes and go up against a villain but there are some changes in the x-men united first of all some characters in the in this set uh magneto and mystique can be played as a hero or a villain. Hmm. And uh, then you also can play as heroes. You can play as Professor X, um, Beast, Cyclops, Jean Grey, Storm. And then the other villains are Sabretooth. And uh, who's the other villain? We got Mystique, Magneto, Sabretooth, and Juggernaut. Juggernaut. Hmm. So you pick a villain, you pick some heroes, you set up six locations, and then you play a card-legging game in which the villain lays a card out from their deck, the heroes lay cards out, and you're moving around and trying to stop them. Each villain has their own little thing in which they can win and ways, and then a way for them to be defeated. And then each hero has a special deck that has different icons in the cards that let you move, do heroic actions, fight, and um, you know just kind of move around and try to get the right things done at the right time. And it's it's very fun. It's very plug and play. You're like, we'll take these three heroes, we'll take this villain. And you can mix and match it with the original X-Men United, which, I mean, Marvel United, which is really Marvel cheap. United, yeah. Marvel United is really inexpensive if you want to hunt that one down. So you can have Captain America and Wolverine, who I forgot to mention is in the set. Captain America and Wolverine go up against Red Skull or Cyclops and Jean Grey and Storm taking on Kingpin. Hmm. Um, so it's fun, but this also adds a few other things. It adds a way to play a one verse many mode now where one person plays as the villain. So there's a few minor changes they make. I don't feel like the villain, you have a few choices, but it's still not that big of a deal to me. I I'm okay with just playing the game, um, cooperatively, but it's a lot of fun. It's the X-Men. I, I, this one is a game that has really grown for me and there's a couple reasons i really enjoy it uh well more than that if you include i like marvel a lot but i also like it because it's plug and play it doesn't take long to set up it's really easy to teach it's simple it's fun it's fast but also i can i can beat it occasionally and (laughs) yeah now listen i know i harp on this a lot but i would like to say i now have data to back this up so I asked in our uh, YouTube group, I said, how often would you want to win a cooperative game? I said yeah. 80 to 100 percent of the time, uh, then 51 plus percent of the time, 50 percent of the time, 25 to 50 percent of the time, or on rare occasions, I want it as hard as possible. Yeah. What do you think got the most? Uh... I mean, I my brain says the 50%, but I bet it's the next notch up, the higher than 50%. You're right. The 51 to 70% of the time got 47%. That's almost yeah. half the people want to win a game somewhere between, you know, 50% and two-thirds of, or three-fourths of the time. The, the second highest, that 22%, was 50%, like you thought maybe. The yeah. third highest was the 80 to 100% of the time at 17%. <laughs> then the fourth at only 11% was 25 to 50% of the time, and 3% said they want it as hard as possible. But that yeah. 3% and 11% are so loud online. <laughs> no, I'm serious. There's a really? reason Forbidden Desert and Forbidden Island have sold a ton. 
There's a reason pandemic yeah. does well because pandemic, while yes, once you go to the higher levels and it is extremely difficult, but it's base level. It's very beatable. Yeah. People don't well, I mean, want to be on, knocked down. I think on basic down. level, on basic, it should be in that 80% range. Like you should be failing if you're not understanding the game very well and making mistakes. Sure. My first couple of games kind of be... got slapped around. If you don't know what you're doing, you can, <laughs> you can have a, some right. bad games even on the easy level. Sure. And, and that's fine with me. Like, oh, yeah, well, we totally messed that up. But if you're playing well, you should have a pretty good win rate on the easiest level on these games, I think. Right, and I think that's okay. And so my call to publishers is stop listening to people who think games should be as hard as they can. It's, it's, all, it's a simple solution to me. Make your game beatable and then add stuff in there. they be like, oh, you think it's too easy? Do this, this, and this. Then the people right. who want it to be hard can have a hard game. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> but that's why I like this one, because I don't think Marvel United or X-Men United, the one I'm talking about here, is that difficult. And I want you to keep this in mind that I just said that. I'm, I'm going to return <laughs> to this in a moment. Interesting. We'll, we'll put a lantern on that and move on. Uh, I didn't. Uh, I didn't back X Men United. We still have plenty of content for Marvel, um, and and just didn't need to go that much deeper into this game. Oh, the kids right. have enjoyed it, but there's just so much to explore with the Marvel set. If you if you backed it on Kickstarter, I would only say all back that extra it stuff. If for some reason, you like really love the X Men, right? But if you're happy right. with like let's say the Marvel Cinematic Universe, almost all that stuff's in the first set, right? So last for me, and I have to give credit to Suzanne for alerting me to this, is a digital version of Exit, which is kind of entertaining because uh, what we've said about many of the escape room games that we've uh, seen in the past few years is that they remind us of point-and-click adventure games. Um, and some, especially like Unlock and, and some of the others, have, have been like very close to, to that feeling. So to see it come full circle... And now there is an actual app for Exit is interesting. Uh, the version I saw, the, the first installment of this is called the Hotel Ophir, O-P-H-I-R. Um, and the story is that you are visiting this strange hotel and no one's there. You're trying to find where somebody disappeared to and you're traveling around and, and solving puzzles. Um, you are now using point and click stuff, uh, zooming in on things, picking up objects, rotating those objects. There is a system where you can start putting notes. You can draw on objects and your little notes will stay there. Um, much like Exit, one of the hallmarks of the Exit games is that it's sort of works outside the box and has you thinking in ways you didn't expect to with the components you're presented with. And this sort of does that as well um, without, you know, spoiling anything. You're, you're just going to be using the, the stuff you're presented with in ways you didn't expect. Um, and, and that is what I would expect from an exit game. However, when you compare it, when, when suddenly you put exit in these... Um, you know, in this realm of point-and-click adventure games or app adventure games, it's now competing with a bunch of other more robust systems. That This game is fine. It, it had interesting puzzles. It has a nice hint system. It seems to work. Uh, I, I had a, a good time. I was challenged by some of the puzzles. Some had me scratching my head and needing the, the uh, hint system in the end. Um, I just didn't quite understand what they were going for, but that's par for the course with Exit. Um, but there are other games like uh, the the Forgotten, um, oh Forever Lost series that just do this better. Um, they have a better note taking system, a photo system, a, a way of just working your way through puzzles that has been honed a little bit better. Um, and if you're looking for a new one that breaks the the walls, um, there is no game is a, an app that I have been enamored with since I discovered it a couple weeks ago. That's better than Exit as far as offering a new and different digital puzzle experience. So I'd recommend both of those. There is no game and Exit, but if you want to push the walls a little bit on what is expected from this sort of thing, There Is No Game is the better game, and Exit the app needs to sort of raise its game just a little bit to compete. All right, well... Let's jump to a game that is in the mass market, uh, which kind of ties into later on in this episode. Quite apt, isn't it? And this is Disney Sidekicks. So this is uh, from Spin Master, 
uh, who also, just as a heads up, did the last game I talked about with Simon, the X-Men United, which I really liked from Spin Master, and Eric Lang, who also was part of the designer for the last game, blah, 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 blah. But, <laughs> okay. Disney Sidekicks is a game in which you are one of the sidekicks in from one of the Disney films. You're either Timon and Pumbaa together. They're like one model. Tinkerbell, mm-hmm. Abu, um, or the, actually you can have the three fairies from uh, uh, Cinderella. Cinderella? Yeah, yeah. So you're, yeah. you're going up against... Sleeping Beauty. Sorry, the three fairies. Sleeping Beauty, you're Sleeping right. Beauty. Uh, not Cinderella. Cinderella's yeah. the mice. Um, so then you, and then, so you're also going up against villains, Captain Hook, Gaston, Maleficent, etc. So, um, yeah, you can be the clock if you want to. Anyway, or is it the candlestick? It's the candlestick. Lumiere. Um, ah, Lumiere. So you're, you, you, let's say you're playing three sidekicks, then you're playing against the three villains. They've captured the heroes of the story. They stick them in a castle in the middle of the table. And then... It's it's your typical do good guy things, then bad guys do things. There's a deck of cards. The bad guys have henchmen who run around the board, depending on who's out there. The bad guys themselves are moving around, coming after you. Um, like, for example, if you fight Jafar, um, he has the genie under his control. But you can free the genie from his control, but then he'll get the genie back under his control and send the genie after you. Things like that. Uh, the You... As characters have some special cards, you'll draw three of them from a pile at the beginning of the game, and you have special abilities that you can get, but you have to get, like, star tokens to put on these cards to kind of activate them to get them going. Villains are also getting star tokens, which makes them much harder to defeat. So basically, you need to defeat at least one of the villains, and then you need to free all the people from the middle of the castle. You do this by, you know, just various uh, card play, dice, etc., this game is incredibly difficult. Uh, it is, first of all, the components are fine. The miniatures are fine, are good, the, the artwork's good, but all the tokens are tiny, teensy, eensy, weensy tokens. They're, they're not very useful. It's not a very hmm. heavy game, but it's difficult. If you don't believe me, just go to Board Game Geek and see what this thing says. Like This, this thread says, this game should be called Disney Dark Souls. Um... <laughs> This one says, okay, so the game is hard. Any suggestions to fix? This says, famed game designer forgets he's designing a family game. Prepare to lose and frustrate your children. Hmm. (sighs) This one says, gaming teeth kicked in. I'm really disappointed by this because, again, it's not so much that the game is hard. Because hard games can exist. It's that Mr. and Mrs. Smith are going to go to the store and buy this. They're yeah. going to take it home and get their teeth kicked in. And they're not going to play it anymore. Yeah. Now, I did beat it. We beat it as a family, but it was straight up luck. There was nothing we did. I mean, we I, I felt like the decisions weren't that 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 difficult. The, the game is there's really nothing that exciting there in the game itself. The most exciting thing is simply the fact that, Hey, it's a Disney game. You're the sidekicks, which by the way, I like that theme, but right. it's kind of, you do good things, bad things happen. There's spreading of henchmen and things like that, that if they spread too much, you know, you could lose the game that way or, you know, take damage, etc. You know, so you don't want, so it has that, you know, it's pandemic y and stuff. I was just really disappointed because it's a cool looking box. I don't know if you've seen this, Eric, at all. No. I know that if you saw it, you would be tempted to buy it on the spot. Hmm. Because you're Disney. You like Disney. You like the sure. idea of the sidekicks. I, I, I know, Eric. I know you would like this. this and you like cooperative games. But yeah. whew, I don't know why it's so difficult. And I don't know. It's just problematic. Hmm. So we'll see. Maybe someone will point out that there's a rule missing in the rule book or something, you know, I don't know. Um, But um, again, I think people don't want to be beat down all the time. And I know for sure kids don't. That's true. When I play a game with my kids and it's a cooperative game, they want to win. And in fact, I played another game. This one was from Prospero Hall about Mickey and the Beanstalk. You know that cartoon where he goes and rescues the harp? Yeah. Yeah, So they made that into a game. And that's a really, really simple game. It's for very young children. But you can very easily lose the game 
just by blind luck. You spin a spinner, you put a token on a board, you get too many tokens on that board, you lose. Hmm. My son was like, well, what could, uh, why did we lose? What could we do differently? I was like, nothing. And kids yeah. just don't like that. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, they, they, they'll, they'll take a, oh, we lost by a little bit or whatever. And what, let's, let's play it again and beat it. But they're not going to take loss after loss. They're going to say, I don't want to play this anymore. Right. Um, so anyway, yeah, that, yeah. That, that saddens me. Disney sidekicks. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. But, but you know what? Tell us briefly about a game that really is good for kids. Support for the Dice Tower comes from The Op, presenting Scooby-Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansion, a coded chronicles game. Like, it's time for a mystery, Scoob! Scooby-Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansion brings the escape room experience to the table with the Coded Chronicles series. This thematic and immersive co-op game takes the players through this escape room in a box with the gang as they solve the mystery at the Haunted Mansion. Designed by Sen Fung Lim and Jay Cormier, this custom mystery is brand new to the Scooby-Doo gang and feels just like an episode from the show. You put players into the roles of the gang as they try to solve the mystery. It's filled with puzzles, clues, and a great story. Everyone has to work together to escape the haunted mansion. Each character has their own unique ability and narrative guide, which will have you talking like the characters in the game. If you like escape room games, be sure to check out the Coded Chronicles line, as the op has not just one for Scooby-Doo, but also The Shining and The Goonies. It's available now at theop.games or your local game store today. And exclusively for Dice Tower listeners, you can get 10% off your entire purchase at theop.games. That's available for all games, puzzles, and accessories. It also includes free shipping on purchases of $49 or more. This is available for U.S. residents only, but all you have to do to get this offer is enter the code Dice Tower, all one word, Dice Tower, at checkout at theop.games. And now, another tale of board gaming horror. Oh my, that's horrific. Gather round, children. I'm a huge Arkham Horror fanboy, and Arkham Horror 2nd Edition was my number one game for many years until I stopped cutting off my nose to spite my face and tried Mansions of Madness 2nd Edition and Eldritch Horror. Cut to Essenspiel 2018, where I was aimlessly wandering around the Asmodee shop in Hall 1 when a stack of games plonked in a corner that were pretty much unadvertised caught my eye. I know that artwork, I thought, and to my excitement, I may well have let out a high-pitched squeal. I saw a box reading Arkham Horror 3rd Edition. I actually couldn't believe my eyes and had to blink a few times before I believed the treasure that I was holding. In case this was all a mistake and some poor employee had accidentally put these beauties on display, I rushed to the checkout and presented my precious. To my amazement, the lovely person at the checkout asked if I would like the deluxe hardback rule book to accompany the game. Yes, I would, please! I pretty much shouted at the poor lady. Anyway, it made my Essen that year, and when I arrived back at the airport, I took my copy of Arkham Horror 3rd Edition out of the case to check it over, and all was good. It was raining, so I placed the case and my beautiful game into the boot, the trunk, then sped home, legally, maybe. I arrived home and immediately went to the boot to get out Arkham Horror, but found a pool of water and a very soggy box where the water had cascaded in due to a massive leak that was generally funneling the water into the very spot Arkham Horror occupied. I went to pick it up, and the box folded over and plopped into the car. In a fit of rage, I picked up, no, scooped up the game and its soggy components and hurled them into my garage before storming into the house to tell my wife about the horror that had just unfolded. Although I have replaced the game now, 
and my wonderful wife even managed to source a copy of the deluxe rules again. The memory of this still pains me, and every now and then I catch a glimpse of a location tile or a monster token in my garage, and I get shivers up my spine. <laughs> why why would I don't get the you don't clean your garage? <laughs> I Though things can uh, hide in the garage. I especially know. monsters. I know. I I have a, a long old man yells at the cloud moment about every time I don't use the garage very often. The the kids and my wife use it more. And anytime I need to go in there to get something, I'm like, why does this death trap exist? This is for parking cars. No one does that. Right, but well. it could be for parking cars. Yeah. All right. I, yes. I love a good tale of cardboard destruction, though. It's been a while since we've had those. What, you love this? What is wrong with you? Schadenfreude. Um, but yes. All right. As far as like the quality of a tale of horror, I'm just saying it makes a good story. All right, well, let's jump to some questions. Here we go. Questions. 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 Our first question, Ryan and Christy together said that they love playing a four-person game by each controlling two players. Like Small World, they each run two full sets on a four-player map. So mm. fun. Does anyone else do this? If so, we'd love to hear your opinions. Interesting. I, I don't know if I've ever done this on a... Um on a competitive game. I've, I've certainly <laughs> done a two-player game by myself, um, but we have done it. My wife and I have done it in Pandemic um, when we were you know, playing the heck out of that game. Uh, we would sometimes do two characters each and play a four-player game with just the two of us because it allowed us to play around with more character abilities and synergies and stuff, and we just we found it more fun that way. And I think we may have played at least a little bit of Pandemic Legacy that way too. Um, when my son dropped out and it was just the two of us playing, I think we played four characters. Yeah, there's some people who are listening who shivered when they heard this because <laughs> I know there's some people who really hate this. It doesn't bother me, although I do find it a little confusing. But like Eric said, we actually were just talking about uh, Marvel United earlier in the episode, and that has a sole variant of sorts, but I always just play three characters. I play mm. three characters. I run all three. I have three hands because the hands are only three cards or four cards. It's not hard to keep track of them. Right. And I just like, I don't mind. And if I, sometimes when I'm playing a cooperative game and someone's like, oh, we, we want four characters. I was like, I'll play two of them. You know, I'm, I'm okay with that. I keep the stuff differentiated. Yeah. 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 But in a bigger game, like I can't imagine playing small world. I, mean, I guess I can't imagine it, but it would be, I don't, I think I could pull it off, but I don't think I'd want to. <sighs> yeah, I know there's certainly there's there's variants for two player games where you end up playing multiple factions. I'm thinking of um, on the underground where you end up playing multiple train lines uh, or, or some other games that, that have a rule that you get to play multiple factions. But then your score is the lower of the two or it's a combination of the two or there's some sort of reason why you can you have to somehow work together with those two factions to make it work. And that's somewhat interesting. I like doing that. Dan says, you have recently reported that some publishers are returning the rights of a game back to the original designer. In conjunction with Tom's rule, or Vassal's law, if an out-of-print board game is good, it will eventually be reprinted. Do you right. think that there will ever be the option to purchase these games from a print-on-demand service? Do you think that if they are made with lower quality components, the game would still have the same feel when you play them? Yeah, so publishers can return the rights of a game back to the designer or it can just happen automatically. Right. Sometimes the rights are tied up. Sometimes the designer is the publisher and they just don't feel like publishing it anymore. So my, my, my vassal's law is that any great game is going to eventually be reprinted. And you could say, well, that's obvious, like, oh, 200 years, it will be reprinted. But that's not what I mean. I mean that most, if a game is considered widely by people to be great, unless there's some thing that actively keeps it from happening, like an intellectual property, Star Wars, Queen's Gambit, mm -hmm. or a big legal thing, like Glory to Rome, um, they're going to be reprinted. In fact, 
Good games are reprinted, and even mediocre games are getting reprinted. Everything's reprinted these days. <laughs> yes. Um. So, but what the what I mean by that is, don't go like, oh, I can't get this out of print game. Just play some of the amazing games that exist now. Yeah. And wait for that one to come back. In fact, one of my favorite games that has been out of print for a while, I know is being reprinted with a new cool theme. And that's all I can say. But it's cool. <laughs> I'm excited about it. You know. Anyway. Uh, cool. So. Th- the designers get it back. Well, if they get it back, they're likely going to go to another publisher if the game is worth it. Yeah. If it's not worth it, then yeah, maybe you could get a print-on-demand service with lower quality components, and maybe that makes you happy. I know someone who's recording a podcast now who has done such a thing. Okay. It's not me. No, but <laughs> Eric, you made your own copy of Merchants of Venus. Well, yeah, um, certainly when, when it was out of print and that was the way to, to make it happen, you know, build your own copy, that was, that was how I did it. Um, I think the goal of a designer, if you get your, your game back, like Tom said, the goal would be to get it to another publisher, uh, to, to have them handle the logistics. of if, if that's not your usual business, you would still want someone else to handle those aspects of it. Um, because... More, more to Dan's point, do you think that if they're made of lower quality components, if it's a print-on-demand service that traditionally just doesn't have as finely tuned components, you can get some great results from some of the print-on-demand uh, companies, but it's usually not custom minis or or specialized component counts and stuff like that. Um, I guess I agree, but then if that's really the case, then save up the money and hunt one down. You know, if that really bothers you... Or sure. play one of the many similar games. I would really have a hard time. In fact, I think, I think, let me see if this is the case. I think I just saw a thread on Reddit that was saying, hey, folks, let's debunk Vassal's Law. Let's see. Oh. There was there was several um, posts that said I was a moron, so I'm not, you know, there's that. Good, good. That's um, always good. Um... Yeah, okay, so here was someone said, what game defies Vassal's Law? So people are like, okay, so this happens. So the thing that people said here was Heroescape. So that's one that's not going to come back in print because the plastic is too expensive, and also the rights are probably tied up by Has- Hasbro. Right. Someone said Ethnos, but I really think Ethnos will get remade soon. Someone said Valdora. Well, Valdora, no one's really clamoring for that. One or two people. Yeah, that's true. I, I like the game, but, uh, you yeah. know. That that's it. It's debatable whether it's considered a great game. Someone said Escape from Colditz, but guess what? It just was reprinted. It by, was reprinted, right? Dungeon Twister is out of print, uh, but as much as I like that game, it's not as strong of a game for a lot of people. Um, someone said in here, uh, you know, the, the, but a lot of these games, I'm not looking at these games going, oh yes, a lot of people want this to be done, like Hero Quest. Someone said, but hey, guess what? Hasbro's reprinting it. Um, somebody right. said, uh, "Add Astra," but guess what? They're reprinting that just under a different name. Uh, right. And so, again, I'm, I'm not saying that I'm not like trying to hold myself up here. I'm saying, from a gamer's standpoint, this really shouldn't be a problem for almost anyone. Like maybe if you're a collector and you're like, I have 4,000 games and I'm hunting down the specific one. I get that. Sure. But if you're like, oh, I really want to play Gore to Rome, but it's really expensive and it's out of print. Sure. But there's many other games that give you that same feel. Right. Like Mo- Mo- Montana. Montani. Montani from the same designer yep. or the dinosaur one, Uchronia. Yes, it's not going to be perfect. But guess what? There's Again, there's so many other games out there. And if you really do think like, no, Glory Rome is my favorite game. It's the one game I want. It's the only game. Well, then save up the money and get it. You know, because then, 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 it, then that vast amount of money you pay for it is worth it to you. Mm-hmm. But if you balk at the price of an out of print game, then you really don't want it that much. And you can go find another one. I think. Okay. I'm not sure if that was the direction Dan was going with the question. Or... No, I, he probably wasn't. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know if, if, if Dan's just looking for out of print stuff or, or if Dan's you know, actually looking for the possibility of publishers putting their stuff on a print on demand service if they get the rights back. Well, Dan, if you're listening, I would actually like to know, maybe you could follow up on this. Like, what are these games that you particularly are looking for? 
because I'm trying to think of a game that I would want to print on demand anyway, or that is out of print and the designer has the rights back, but they're not doing anything with it. That just seems right. very, very, very rare. Yeah. If the designer has the rights back, I promise you that there's a 99% chance, not always, because for example, I'm pretty sure the designer, Merchants of Venus, did not care one whit if he made any money. <laughs> um, no, I really think that, but I think that's rare. They want to make money, so they're probably going to shop it around to some publishers. Right. Sarah says that she has the, the too long don't read. Her question is, why do people specify when a game is from Kickstarter? So, oh, uh, yeah. So Sarah's like a lot of the times we'll say, oh, this is a game from Kickstarter and it's by so-and-so. It's just sort of like a descriptor at this point. Right, and so she says that she doesn't back Kickstarters because it's more expensive to buy that than a retail later, especially if you get free shipping. But uh, she says she's thrown off when someone says this is a Kickstarter game called the ABC game. There's a vari- there's such a variety of games now. It doesn't say anything about the game itself. It used to mean that the game wouldn't be available in retail or that it's a big box killing monster kind of game or it's not available yet. What does that mean? And she says everyone does it, not just us. But I do it. So I, I do it for a couple reasons. When I say something's a Kickstarter game, it gives you an impression of the kind of game it is in your head. And yes, there's a, I, I think over 50% of games that are coming out now are coming from Kickstarter. So that's, it's probably getting to be less of a useful thing. But it lets you know that the game was already Kickstarted. Um, it lets you know that it was backed, it's out. You can infer from the fact there's a Kickstarter game, there's a possibility that there's a lesser version available in retail, or it might mm-hmm. not be available in retail at, at all, that there might be a gazillion expansions for it or stretch goals that you can't get now. I just, I, 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 maybe I shouldn't, maybe it's becoming, I don't know if I could stop doing it. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I get what you're saying. And I, and I think earlier on, um, it, it could be used almost as a pejorative or maybe not that far, but more as a warning um, we sort of excused more sloppy art design or or some rough edges in a product because uh, to say something was a Kickstarter game would often be synonymous with self-published. Um, this was a passion project, and it, it's somebody who's this is their first or second publishing adventure, and they raised the money to make this dream happen. But that's not necessarily the case anymore. Uh, just calling something a Kickstarter game doesn't mean it has rough edges it it can it just means that's how the money was raised for it um but i do agree that that you might be highlighting the fact that there could be multiple versions of the game out there that something that was uh, a kickstarter project may have a super deluxe version or have exclusive content that you would only be able to get now hearing about it if you track down the kickstarter version of that game as opposed to the retail version of the game. And it's it's almost a warning. It's just, it's one more data point um, to bring up, I guess. Robbie says, I'm working my way backwards through the podcast since becoming a listener, and I find it great fun seeing how the show has changed. Are there any moments I should listen out for? I know I'll eventually reach a point where Eric joins, but what were the biggest points where you made some major changes or shook things up a bit? Hmm. You want to tackle that one first? You want to get to Robbie's other questions? Well, no. I mean, going backwards through the podcast, every time there's been a new host has obviously been a change. Episode 50 sure. was not just a change in... Um, was not just a change in... A host changing from Joe to Sam, but also I changed the whole way the show ran, mm. you know, adding in contributors going from Sam to Eric was a change. In fact, from Sam to Eric, there was like a few one time hosts of the <laughs> of the Dice Tower. Yep. And then uh, adding Mandy and Suzanne was a change. And then uh, we dropped all the contributors and moved to a slightly different format. Mm-hmm. Those would be the biggest changes I can think of. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we we've done some changes in in timing too. I think we were we were biweekly for a long time, and then we tried various ways of being weekly. Um, we'd sometimes record two episodes at once, uh, and and just sort of messed with the format to to get into a cadence that allowed us to release every week. Right. 
And now we can stay far more consistent because, you know, with four hosts, we can shuffle around and, and fill in when somebody's, say, going to Gen Con. What is the most emotionally invested you have ever been in the narrative of a board game? Say, to the extent that you might in a book or a film. Or to put it another way, who do you think the best writer is currently in the industry? That's an interesting way to put that. I think the best writer... Oh, well, that'd be a tough one. I think that I don't know if it's which of the lockets wrote Sleeping Gods. Mm. Um, actually, I, I should know that because I think they I think they have it marked. They they had a third writer too in there, right? I think they marked who wrote what paragraphs. I think. Okay, if I'm remembering correctly, but that writing is really good, really good. I enjoyed that writing. Um, the most invested though had I don't think it had to do with the writing as much as the events. But even though I think the other, I, I, I liked Pandemic Legacy Season Zero the best, Season One, I was so invested as to what was going to happen next. Yeah. Because yeah. I hadn't done something like that before. I had played Risk Legacy, but Risk Legacy, I wasn't involved in the story as much as I was just like, oh my goodness, the rules changed. Yeah, let's this see what new, happens. Because cause Risk kind of reset each game. You could even play a different faction. Yeah. You know, so you... It wasn't the same thing, and 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 pandemic. I was playing the same character, yeah. Or 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 I I well, I always played the same character. I might switch from character to character, but no one else played my character. That's my <laughs> character, right? right? And so yeah, yeah. when the things happened in this one, it I was like, what? And I was just I was so pumped. I was like, oh, it's time to play pandemic. I pulled it out. I was super excited. It gave me the same feeling I think some people have with a role playing game. Yeah, yeah, uh, I would agree with pandemic legacy. I've had some games of Battlestar Galactica that have been very roller coaster dramatic and the reveal, you know, if a Cylon's able to stay hidden till the very end and then pulls a move that just tanks everything, that, you know, the table just explodes. Um, uh, my friend Dan was, was hiding in plain sight the whole time. We just did not uh, believe he was, he was a bad guy and then pulled the you know, coup d'etat at the end of the game and just destroyed us all. And it was amazing. And and those sorts of moments are amazing, but that's not necessarily a writer that causes that to happen. It's the situation of the game um, and the interaction between the people. I think you've spoken about what sort of licenses you'd like to see implemented in a board game before, but are there any games you think could be perfectly rethemed with a specific property? I'd love a version of Castle Panic reskinned as the Gaulish Village in the Asterix comics, for example. Well, if that was the case, wouldn't would any Romans get there? <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't. There would there would be no pressure. <laughs> well, we just There's, saw what was it? Flip ships that got reskinned as space invaders, right? That's definitely one. I I probably wouldn't have thought of it, but it's definitely one. Every time you played Flip Ships, I'd be like, "This is Space Invaders, the game," but it's not. You know, very similar to um, a, a, Nemesis. This is Aliens, mm. except it's not. You know, there, there's, yeah. a, there's a few games like that, like totally retheming the game. I'm sure there's something, but it doesn't usually come to my mind. It's interesting because I'm sure that uh, a lot of these games that feel like those properties that you know of may have been designed that way. If not, they... If not specifically designed to be a thematic tie-in, then at least to say, well, yeah, this was inspired by Aliens, or this was inspired by uh, the the Match Three game that I, you know, that's inspired by Candy Crush or something. Um, but it's it's interesting to I don't know how often they then actually land that license, um, or or in the case of the Flip Ships uh, Space Invaders thing, that they sort of evolve into that license. Um, it 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 would be interesting to reskin, and lots of people do that on Board Game Geek. Reskin these games with, uh, you know, a Simpsons reskin, isn't it? Uh, it's uh, Mike Parkinson that turns everything into a Simpsons game. Yes, yes. we had a it can uh, be done. Uh, my Chris Yee, who works for Dice Tower now, one of my video editors, huge Simpson fan, and at Gen Con, he and Mike Parkinson were together, and I said, uh, Mike, Chris is a bigger Simpson fan than you, and then I ran away. <laughs> Um. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um. 
Last question from Robbie. Do you have any guilty pleasure games? Titles that you probably wouldn't review at all well or recommend, but you somehow still love regardless of their faults. Maybe it's it's really hard whenever someone asks this because if it's a guilty pleasure game, then I probably think it's good. I don't mm-hmm. I mean I mean I don't necessarily think that the things are false. Uh, I used to have some specific games, but I've kind of fallen out of favor. Like maybe Magical Athlete fits this category, right? It's roll and move. But you know what? Despite yeah. the fact that it's roll and move, it's so fun that I don't I don't think that's a fault. I think that's a benefit to the game. Right. I mean, the, the reason that you're playing it is is that it's an enjoyable activity. Um, it, so, it might not be it might not have a measure of quality to it. Uh, but it's a blast to play. So, yeah, I would recommend that game. I, I think I'm on the same track here. Yeah, people ask this a lot. Like, you know, someone will say, this is often, this comes up with movies, right? A guilty pleasure movie is a movie mm. that is not highbrow. It's not considered a classy movie at all, but you just enjoy it. Like, you know, B movies, you might like a specific one. Like, for example, for me, I don't think anyone's going to call Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure highbrow. Right. But I love it. But you know what? I can put that in my top 100 movies and I don't care if it's highbrow or not. So I feel the same way with games. So if I'm playing Igloo Pop and I'm shaking little igloos to guess how many Eskimo children are rattling around inside. (laughs) Or if I'm playing even a very popular game like Galaxy Trucker, which is not necessarily a great game. You're just building a ship and then randomly watching it get blown to pieces. But I have so much fun. I just played a game called Necromolds. Have you heard of this one, Eric? No. It's a miniatures game. It's a pretty light miniature game where you just run your units at each other and roll dice and hit them. Except when you hit them, you then smash their units because everything's made out of Play-Doh. Right. And that's fun. And I don't care. So, yes, I guess you could call those guilty pleasures. But when it comes to ranking games and putting them on my lists, I don't care. So, I mean, some people would look at Pitch Car and kind of scoff at it. I think it's fantastic. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I had a game. I played a game like that called Hulk Smash, where you made molds of cars and trucks, and then it came with a big plastic Hulk fist, and you could smash the the cars and trucks. Yeah, and that's just yell it. that's just fun. That sort of thing. It I is love fun. it. Yeah. All right, let's go to the market. Woo! It's a dice tower top. The Dice Tower's Top 10 list is brought to you by Game Nerds at GameNERDZ.com. All right, so today we're doing You've got some splaining to do, Vassal. I texted you. I have a text Yeah, okay. And so uh, earlier in the week, I texted Tom and I said, what what exactly do you mean by mass market games? What what is our definition here? And Tom responds with saying, oh, no, we're talking about like mass market. We're talking Hasbro. We're talking Mattel, that sort of thing. And so I'm going, OK, so even though we're seeing lots and lots of more designer stuff in the bid box stores, what would be a mass market release of games that we'd consider hobby space games, I'm going to. I'm going to put the blinders on and we're going to make the list that says these are the games that you would only go to a mass market store to get. You probably would not find these in a diehard hobby store. And if it is, it's in a corner of the hobby store that's like, well, here's the here's the mass market games. You, if you want to get that, you can get that. So that's what I did. And then Tom this morning texts me and says, on second thought, just do whatever you want. And I'm like, why, why are you telling me this? I made my list already. And now I see why, looking at your list, you put all no. these other games no. on your list. No, no. First I of see. all, I'm not sorry. And I'll tell bait you why. Switch. Bait and switch. Definitely is bait and switch. But it, but I also <laughs> gave you enough time because I made my list this morning. So I was busy. Anyhow. Anyhow. Um, actually, I made it. This was, was this this morning? I think it was yesterday. It was this morning. You texted me this morning. I'm looking like at this 8 a.m. Yes. I'm about to hop in the booth and start work. And you're like, well, in second thought, just do whatever you want. Yeah, okay. So here's the thing. You said Wingspan originally. Uh-huh. And just because you said Target has on its shelf. But I think mass market means it's much more widely available. And Wingspan is not quite there yet, in my opinion. The games I put on my list are very much widely available everywhere. 
Secondly, you have games in your list that are hobby games. You just stuck them on your list because whatever. Interesting. Your number three is a hobby game. Oh, it's sold definitely in the in the your regular space. Your number one is one of the biggest hobby games of all time. It's made by Hasbro. <sighs> it's made by Hasbro's hobby division. Splitting hairs. I agree, but also some of mine I like to hear your reasoning why they're not mass market. <laughs> so this is going to be a fun list. It's basically I'm just saying the only one I could see No, I can't. I can't see it. Okay, so here's what I did. I said, let's talk about games people can get now because otherwise it's kind of pointless. I mean, That's true. I, yeah. And so I did that. And I also more than Eric had a chance to look at the people's choice ahead of time and I was like, I don't uh. want to be uh, well, they're putting all these games in the list, so, yeah. so, so I, I wondered. I wondered if you saw the People's Choice and went, all right, I guess we got to open the floodgates here. So we're going to talk about a bunch of games that could be considered mass market. There's no crossover. <laughs> <laughs> no. There no, there isn't. Crossover. We're really close to having one crossover. In fact, I almost put the game that Eric said, but mine was a better one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, here we go. Number 10. You know what, by gum, I'm going to kick things off with Monopoly. I I actually uh, put down Monopoly Tropical Tycoon, but keeping in mind what Tom mentioned about games that you can actually buy right now. uh, Tropical Tycoon was a variant of Monopoly in which you could buy all sorts of cool uh, extra buildings, not just houses and hotels, but like casinos and piers and stuff like that. It used victory points. The game ended when one player went bankrupt. Ah, but... If you play Monopoly, actual Monopoly, by the rules, it can fly by. If you buy property in between players' turns, it can fly by. It's a gambling game. And if you treat it like that, as an investment game and a negotiation game, and play by the rules in the box, Monopoly can be a lovely experience. It's my number 10. Tropical Tycoon or not. Um, I really, really disagree with that it's a good experience, out of the box even following the rules i think monopoly is a flawed broken game and i know that a lot of people enjoy playing it and i know it's cool to hate on monopoly these days but the fact of the matter is monopoly is not a good game um but i do like monopoly tropical tycoon but i don't have it in a library um because well, you can't play a dvd I, I i actually was wondering about that too because you'd have to have a dvd player i wonder if anyone has made an app for tropical tycoon Yes, I was wondering this myself because I saw it. Where did I see it? I saw it sold somewhere. Mm. And I thought, should I get? Oh, it was at a, it was at a flea market. Um, okay. It was at the, the Gathering of Friends. They have like a flea market. Yep, and so yep. someone had Monopoly Tropical Tycoon. And I was like, ooh, I'll put that in the library. And then I'll play it with people. Oh, I don't have to carry around a super portable DVD player. <laughs> I don't want right. to do that. You I, I guess that in the box. I was going to say, maybe you could do that. Like maybe... Like, is a D- portable DVD player worthless enough that you could put it in the box? I, I don't know. It, you'd have to plug it in somewhere. <laughs> you know, yeah, it also comes with a 20-foot extension cord <laughs> and a little screen. No, but you get one of the ones with a screen. I don't right. know. Maybe. Ah, it, it, I'm sure it's an app. I'm sure someone's ripped it somewhere. I think someone. I think last time we said this, someone gave me, sent me a link to it. Um, I, uh, think. I, I'm, I would be surprised if someone hasn't done it, um, which would be cool because sometimes the DVD doesn't work right. Yeah, I'm actually – I'm now looking here and uh, – nope, I'm not seeing it. It wasn't in the last couple years that someone sent this to me. So if someone sent me something about it, it was much longer ago. Hmm. Yeah, anyhow. Great, great choice, Eric. Fantastic choice. My number Thanks. 10 is Santorini. Now, Santorini is an abstract strategy game that really hit the mass market hard. I saw this at, well, before it went out of business, it was at Toys R Us. I've seen it at Walmart. I've seen it at Target. It's everywhere. Defy me, Eric. It's a mass market game. I mean, if you're going to expand it to the stuff that is also hobby, then yeah. I, but how I mean, do you determine if it's hobby or not? You're just making up that delineation yourself. That's why I put the blinders on. Anyway. Anyway, Santorini, mass market game. Um, it's a great abstract strategy game. It's two to three players. In fact, they came out with a, a new one, Santorini New York, only sold in mass market stores. Um, but uh, they're both good, and uh, they're worth getting. They're, they're excellent games. 
Good choice. Number nine. My number nine is Looping Louie, or if you want the one that's a little easier to get, Looping Chewie, the uh, the Star Wars themed one. Uh, it's a dexterity game that uses a motorized rotating uh, plane or Millennium Falcon, and you're sort of batting it with little bats to keep it in the air and keep it away from your chickens or whatever it is in Looping Chewie, which is what stormtrooper heads, something like that. Um, it dive bombs your little tokens. You're trying to stay alive and stay in the round. Looping Louie or Chewy, number nine. You know, today I was cleaning out my office and I had a box of spare parts of games. I'm like, all right, I got to put these back. And I found a Imperial Stormtrooper token for Looping Chewy. And I thought, I don't even have Looping Chewy anymore. But oh. if I ever get a copy of it, I have an extra token. And you know <laughs> that's important because you lose those tokens. It's true. You need the right number. My number nine is a very much mass market game because GameRight is clearly a mass market company. And this is Forbidden <sighs> Desert. And you would have put this on your list. You just forgot. No, I would have. I, I basically, I just got fed up with the, the whole thing. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not redoing the whole list. I'd have to start over. Um, yes, Forbidden Desert is a great game. Please continue. It's a cooperative game that is beatable. I put this over Forbidden Island. I think they're both really good games. Um, but Forbidden Desert, I just like a little bit better. There's also one called Forbidden Skies, but um, again, play Forbidden Island or Forbidden <laughs> Desert. I'm yes, not I, kidding. I'm more forgiving on Skies, but I will certainly agree. Desert is the top, just barely beating out Island, and then Sky is is lower. Number eight. My number eight is the one that Tom thought was close, but I picked Escape Room the Game. This is the one that has a, a chrono decoder. Wait a minute, so how very... can you put this one on your list? This is a hobby game. Oh, this is sold. This is like totally sold in Toys R Us and, and Target and stuff. It looks like a toy. I know, that's what I've been saying. Okay, go ahead. Uh, it's the one that has this this plastic box that you're sticking plastic keys in. It's got a cool looking timer. Um, it, but but the game themselves, the puzzles themselves, are very interesting as well. It's a well designed escape room experience. Escape room, the game, number eight. I just saw this sold somewhere. Where was it? Was that I was at some store that had one of these, and I thought, do I have that version? Because I always forget. You know, There's lots if, of themed versions of this now. There's, a, what, a Jurassic Park version? Um, yeah, So, but there's also multiple versions. It's not just the base game. Right. And uh, it, they're like different base games, I guess. And so I, I was like, oh, should I get it? I don't know. I already have like five Escape Room games on my shelf that I haven't played yet. <laughs> and then I left the store. But now it's really bothering me because I don't even remember going to a store recently. So maybe this wasn't a dream? <laughs> Who knows? Where was I? I don't I don't go shopping that much these days in stores. And recently I went to was it at Walmart? But why would I who knows? Okay. My number eight is Codenames. Codenames has sold millions of copies. The vast majority of those millions of copies were sold in mass market stores. Codenames is a great uh party game that works for two players. If you go to Target, you can buy an after dark version, which is silly. Just buy normal versions, or you can get one of the many op versions. There's Disney, Marvel, Pictures, uh, Simpsons. Harry Potter. There is Harry Potter. There's too much code names at this point. So <laughs> I, I I have like four in the library, and I thought, that's enough. Uh, I, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the, the themed versions, I think, are probably even more mass market than the base version. Yeah, I should have had this one. I should have had all of yours. It should have just been your list. <laughs> number seven. My number seven is a word dexterity game called Connexi. Uh, you are, are forming words by connecting these plastic letters together in this balancing, teetering, tottering structure. Uh, and, and as long as you can draw a path through the letters as they're notched into each other, you can form words, um, and you're trying to score points to do so without knocking the whole thing over. It's it's a lovely dexterity spelling game. Connexi, number seven. I don't think I've played this one. All right, my number seven is Villainous, which is where you play some Disney villains, although there's a Marvel version out now, but I like the Disney one better. I believe there are six sets now. I don't know if they're going to do many more of these because they've done almost all the big villains. I know yeah. someone right now is shouting, they didn't do so-and-so, but they did my favorite villain, which was Cruella de Vil, so I don't really care anymore. 
they even did villains I didn't expect, like Steamboat Willie. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, not, not Steamboat Willie, but I guess uh, Pete, right? Is it Ashcan Pete or something Maybe like just that? Pete. Yeah. yeah, whatever. Yeah, they did Pete from Steamboat Willie, and you know, I, I just love it. You just play a villain, and you're trying to accomplish your tasks before everyone else. A great fun game, villainous. It is another excellent game, and and yes, definitely fits in. It probably has sold more in the mass market than anywhere else. Number six. Sequence is my number six. This is a game that uh, I got a lot of play in well before I got into the hobby world. Sequence is a, it's a card game, uses a standard deck of cards and a grid that has those values of cards on them. I think it's a double deck of cards. Um, and you're playing cards and placing chips out to create five in a row. But the way I like playing Sequence is with partners and playing to get two sets of five in a row. So uh, you can play a card and place a chip down, but if your opponents play a card, it can remove your chip. Uh, so you're battling uh, with this this push and pull tug of war, and with the partnership game, it, it gets really interesting with Sequence, my number six. I do like Sequence. I remember buying this at a Kroger's, I believe. <laughs> That's a mass Way market. Back in a day. That's a mass supermarket. Yeah, I think that's where I bought it, and this was when I first got into, uh, back into the hobby, or into the board game hobby, and I was just buying games everywhere, and I saw this one, I was like, gotta try out. I played it, and I thought, that's not so bad, it needs some rule fixes, but hmm. yeah, it was it was fun. Yeah. My number six even fulfills Eric's criteria, Scotland Yard. <laughs> Scotland Yard, where one person is Mr. X, everyone else is trying to find them. I was given this as a gift for a birthday when I was a child. I loved it. Uh, it had to come from mass market. It's the only place my parents shopped. Um, but this game has stood the test of time. I think still plays well today. Scotland Yard. Mm. Number five. My number five is a mass market themed version of a, a well-regarded children's game, Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters. But the themed version is Ghostbusters Protect the Barrier. It was themed after the um, lo- the last Ghostbusters film. And uh, you're, it's a co-op game. You're running around a map that is identical to the Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters map and knocking out ghosts and trying to grab uh, tokens and bring them to the entrance of, of the world. Um, it's, a, it's a cool little co-op. Ghostbusters, Protect the Barrier, my number five. Yeah, I do like this one. Um, I, I don't know. It just, it's, it's, a lot, it's a lot of fun. And you don't have to get the Ghostbuster one if you can't find it. In fact, probably it's not as good quality as the Ghost Fight. I think it's, a maybe, it's, it's not bad, but it's maybe one step down from the quality of the, the other version. My number five is Escape Room in a Box, which sounds really similar to Eric's Escape Room the Game. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Escape Room in a Box, and I think they made two versions of this. One was werewolf-themed, and one was 80s-themed, I think. I can't yes, remember. Yes, the werewolf experiment, and I can't remember the exact title, but it is 1980s-themed. Yeah, and I like this. They're both very fun. They're easy to play. I think Escape Room in a Box is one of my favorites of the genre. It's not that hard. It's actually one of the easiest but there's a lot of physical puzzles in it. A lot of toys in there. Yeah. Yeah. Things that you can't do in many, like in an exit game, they try. They're like, you can fold this paper into a four, four dimensional working machine <laughs> that goes through time. <laughs> They're trying that. But with Escape Room in a Box, you actually could have three dimensional stuff. Right. So if you want to play an Escape Room, I thought this was a good one. Yep. Number four. Number four, another classic Rummy Cube. Uh, all these numbered tiles, and you are drafting them and then trying to form groupings of them. And then the fun of Rummy Cube is that you can rearrange the the sets that are already on the table to get more of your tiles out on the board. Um, as long as you can make everything that's already out on the table work in some sort of combination, and that's the danger. Like, you start splitting sets up, and if you can't make it work, then you you have failed in your goal and you lose your turn. Um, Rummy Cube is a lovely Rummy style game that appeals to everybody. Number four. Do you know, I, I, someone just asked me the other day, what's the most popular game I haven't played? And this is it. Yeah. I've, I've never played Rummy Cube. Interesting. I guess I should. I mean, I, I probably, if, if you, if, if I, I know enough about the game that if you showed it to me, I'd go, oh yeah, I know how to play this. You, you know what I mean? probably would. Yeah. I probably have played games similar enough to it. 
My wife is excellent at this game. Just her brain manages to make those recombinations, and I just sit there and go, what did you just, how did you do that? It's, it's a little scary, actually. My number four is Balderdash. Now, I could have put a lot of party games on this list. Balderdash has, came out when I was a kid somewhere. I remember my parents and their friends having great fun with it, and I got to play a few times, but I just enjoyed watching them play. And now I can play, and it's just as fun. The same game, and they've modified it. They've incorporated the Beyond Balderdash. came out, I don't know, 15 years ago or whatever. It's now just it's the same game, but it's a lot of fun. Balderdash, making up fake definitions. Mm-hmm. Great game. Number three. Number three, Tom complained about earlier. That is Risk Legacy. I, I complained I about somebody... it. What are you talking about? I just said it didn't have as strong of a story. That's all. Well, yeah, I mean, no, you said this didn't apply to the mass market list. Uh, Risk Legacy was the first uh, legacy game. The concept was brand new, but it is a fun ride to to have the persistence of the world that you're building uh, and and have changes to the uh, the cards and the world and the board that persist from from game to game and to see what happens next when you open up the next envelope. Risk Legacy number three. It is a good, good, good game. My number three is Horrified. The you know so Eric mentioned Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters. Horrified is on that same kind of thing except you're going up against the Universal Studio Monsters or the just recently released Americana Monsters mm-hmm. where you're fighting, uh, where you're trying to stop these monsters. So in the first one, you're stopping Frankenstein and Dracula, etc. In the new one, you're stopping the Yeti and the uh, Chupacabra and things like that. So they're, I have not played the new Horrified yet, um, but those who have told me it's essentially the same game with some changes but a lot of fun a good cooperative game horrified uh, it's an excellent game and if i i could have just got over my frustration at the whole thing it would have been on my list number two number two is my party game for the list that is catchphrase and i'm specifically saying the electronic version of catchphrase this thing is just so portable tom did you have the original version of catchphrase with that mechanical wheel thing um i mean it worked it was fine but it was it was a lot of extra pieces. You had to have all those paper dials that fit in there, and and uh, the the buzzer was its own separate device. Now it is one electronic unit, and you select your your topic, and it just it spits out clues, and it does all the timing, and you're passing the hot potato around. It's this self-contained, perfect party game that you can just throw out with anybody. Uh, the electronic catchphrase number two. My number two I mentioned earlier in this episode, Marvel United. It was yep. sold at Walmart before anywhere else. It's from Spin Master, and yep. Spin Master is clearly a mass market game. They make a lot of garbage, but they make some good stuff once in a while. Of course, this was also a cooperative project with Simon, who makes a lot of good stuff. Marvel United, and it's also really inexpensive, like 30 bucks. You get a whole Marvel game. Woo! Yeah, another one that I... I should have, yeah. I, I saw your list. I'm like, yeah, that works, that works, that works. Ah! And I just threw everything and ran away. Uh, Marvel United is a, is a lovely game and an excellent choice. Well done. And finally, number one. My number one, which was originally published by the 3M company, is Acquire. Uh, the stock game where you're collecting tiles and uh, and buying stock in various. It's a lovely stock game, investment game, um, with with a lot of cool mechanisms that still work today. Um, and it's a, it's a solid, solid game that that lives in the hobby sphere. But it was available in the mass market. Acquire my number one. An excellent game. My number one is Ticket to Ride. Clearly yeah. a mass market game at this point. It is. Um. Yeah, it's now the game that I can mention to people, and they know. Now, some people will say, you didn't put Catan, but I, I was picking games I liked for this uh, list. Yeah. I wasn't saying they're the best. I said they're my, well, I kind of said top 10, but they're Tom's top 10. So I like Ticket to Ride a lot. And someone goes to the store and they're like, what should I buy? I'm like, buy a Ticket to Ride. Yeah. Yeah, you but, can't go wrong with it, really. Here's the good news, Eric. I think people agreed with us all. <laughs> Let's go through the people's choice. Number 20. Beyond Balderdash, the sequel to Balderdash. That's a lot of fun. Number 19, Scotland Yard. Number 18, Taboo. A lot of people like Taboo. I don't, it's been a long time since I played it, but I, I, it was fun. Yeah, no, it's good. 17 is Risk. Not okay. Risk Legacy. Not, risk. not Legacy, but just Risk. Yep. 16, Scategories. 15, Rummy Cube. Agreeing with you. 14, Stratego. 
I considered it. Thirteen Balderdash, twelve Seven Wonders, okay. eleven Telestrations, which I didn't. Yeah, think of, no, actually. that's a good choice. Yeah, ten Horrified, nine Monopoly, top ten baby, eight Pandemic, seven okay. Yahtzee. Yahtzee's a good one. I really Yahtzee do. I is good, and I considered it as well. I actually was looking at some of the variants, like Casino Yahtzee, but then I was like, can anyone even consider getting Casino Yahtzee? And so I, I just left it off. Yeah. Number six, Scrabble. Mm-hmm. I hate it. Number five, Chess. Okay. S- number four, Code Names. Number three, Clue. Considered number- it as well. Number two, Catan. And number one, Ticket to Ride. Yeah. I think what this proves is that the term mass market has blended so much that it, it's it's sort of hard to define what that means now. Yeah, I really feel like there's going to be a thread about this, but... Oh, there there's going to be a thread. No, look, I, I think this is an important thing because we throw the word mass market around as a pejorative. We do. Um, right. Many times. But it, it shouldn't be. It should be a positive thing. Hey, you get this in the mass market. Now, yes, there's still... That there's that whole subset of games which we don't even talk about that are just garbage games that are made for the sole purpose of making a quick buck. Mm-hmm. They're made games as made as, as, as possible. to sell as gifts as opposed to actually to be played. Yeah, so bleh, to that. But there's a lot of good games. Every time I go to Target now, I'm amazed with the number of good games that are there. Yeah. Um, I know that even Walmart has. They're they're not as good as Target, but they have a lot of good games. Um, and online, Barnes and Noble you, also has a ton of fantastic games. Well, I almost consider Barnes and Noble like a hobby store at this point. But just about even, even when I go to Amazon. So if I go to Amazon and I type in board games, let's see what the top games that show up there. So Exploding Kittens. Oh, like these are sponsored. Skip the sponsored ones. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So they got high. Uh, Okay, the Amazon page isn't very useful. Let's just do the sponsored ones, I guess. So it's Exploded Kittens, Santorini, Catan, and Splendor. Mm -hmm. Underneath that, I see Life, Life, Monopoly, and Clue. What's this World Monopoly version? It's $579. Wow. It has, it looks like Triopoly, sort of. No, it's just a, it's a really expensive version of Monopoly. Is it gold-plated? Because some of those exist. Uh, apparently, it's done by this artist called Charles Fazzino, mm. and it has die cast tokens and stuff. There's only four left in stock. I just clicked buy it now. Okay. Woo! I mean, you I, should. I I, I I I should? Put it in the library. No. <laughs> On a pedestal in the center of the room. Yeah. All righty. Well, folks, thanks again for joining us here on episode 730. We've talked about mass market games. Lots of cool stuff. And, of course, you can see us. If you're listening to this on Tuesday and you're finishing, why not jump over to the Autumn Spectacular? It's happening right Autumn. now. And, uh, yeah, we call it Autumn because apparently fall is kind of a U.S. term only. Interesting. I think. So, anyhow, okay. Autumn sounds more... <laughs> but, hey, <laughs> Sam Healy's back in the studio with us. Oh, cool. Playing some games. So nice. come on by and watch that. And, of course, don't forget what I said about the different conventions. We hope to see you there. And before we get asked, we are done going to conventions for the rest of this year. So we would love to see you all at some conventions, but that's we're pretty much done for this year with the exception of the Dice Tower Retreat. Yep. I may be at PAX Unplugged. I'm, I'm going to go as a free agent. But as long as that's still moving forward, I'm, I'm planning to drive down for that one. All righty. Well, cool, cool, cool. All righty, folks. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Eric Summerer. And you've been listening to The Dice Tower. Thanks for listening. Promotional consideration has been provided by game publishers in the form of review copies of games. This episode number 730 was recorded on September 30th, 2021. Mandy and Suzanne are with you next week, and in two weeks, it's party time as we revisit our selections for best party games. Support for this podcast comes from listeners like you. Thank you for spreading the word. And speaking of support, the Jack Vassell Memorial Fund is dedicated to providing support to members of the board gaming community in their hour of need. Find out more about the fund's mission and how you can help at jackvassell.org. The Dice Tower is produced by Tom, Mandy, Suzanne, and Eric, with production assistance from Roy Kennedy, Mike Delisio, Chris Yee, and Rob Seary. Our theme was composed by Timothy Pinkham. Having more than one communication device brought to you by Too Many Phones. 
And hosting is provided by Game Nerds, your all-in-one solution for all your nerdy needs at GameNerdsWithAZ.com. We love feedback. Visit the Dice Tower Guild at BoardGameGeek.com, email us at Tom at Dicetower.com or Eric at Dicetower.com, or follow us on Facebook. And of course, you can find more from the Dice Tower Network, including Board with Video Games, Meeple Overboard, Solasaurus, Sporadically Board, Flip Flory, Super Saturday Board Game Serial, Board Game Design Lab, and Dice Tower Now at Dicetowernetwork.com. Until next time, from all the gang at the Dice Tower, have fun gaming. I just don't know what any words mean anymore. That's really what this is. Define the word mass. Yeah, for everybody. I I just was like, so we're just picking all the games? All the games are legal now? You could have put Gloomhaven, Jaws of the Lion. I could have done that. Oh, and by the way, happy year three.